welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to episode 11 of the Madden America podcast. This week we have an interview with Bobby Fiddeman. Bobby is a well-known author, blogger and researcher who has been writing about psychiatric drugs and the many issues involved for over 11 years. In 2011, he released his book, The Evidence However Is Clear, The Siroxat Scandal, which is a powerful and explosive account of his experiences taking and withdrawing from the antidepressant Siroxat. His blog has been viewed over 2 million times, and he is well known by the pharmaceutical regulators and many of the pharmaceutical manufacturers too. He is a rock star of the movement to expose the truth about psychiatric drugs, and to many he's a hero, and to some he is an uncompromising agitator. I was keen to ask Bobby about about his own experiences of the mental health system, his research and campaigning over the years, and his relationships with the UK and US pharmaceutical regulatory bodies. Bobby, welcome. Thank you so much for talking with me today for the podcast. To start with, could you tell me a little about you and what led to your first contact with psychiatric drugs? Well, this this happened, I think it was around about the late 90s. I, um, I was working for a car factory in the Midlands and I developed osteoarthritis in my hip, so I couldn't really carry out the job I was doing anymore. I was on the track. I was putting doors on vehicles and stuff like that. So I went to my doctor, and, um, you know, he sent me to see a specialist, and they kind of confirmed you got the onset of osteoarthritis in your hips. And it was at that point my doctor said that if you continue doing your current job at the car factory, then it's going to get worse. It's not going to get any better. You really need to kind of uh, try and find light duties. So I asked work about light duties, and they told me that they couldn't find me any light duties. So as a result of this, I went back to the doctor. He kind of signed me off work um, because it was getting me down. You know, I, I, I was trying desperately hard to get off the the uh, production track um but they couldn't find me anything so he kind of signed me off work and then as a result of that i became a little bit low and i went back to see him and he prescribed me siroxat which as you know is um uh, a pretty nasty drug and of course at the time you know you you actually think that it's gonna lift you out of the doldrums um so, you know, you, you start taking it and and then for a while, you know, once it kicks in, you really don't care about anything. You, you kind of lose all empathy. So, you know, bills was mounting up and I didn't really care about that. And I also noticed that when I was watching TV and you might see some, you know, disastrous story on the news, it, it just didn't register with me. I... I didn't care, you know, I was just in this bubble, this Siroxat bubble. Mm-hmm. And um, so as a result of that, I um, I had to uh, find a lawyer uh, to sort out all the problems at work. And after about um, a year or so, they stopped my pay, work did, because I was on the sick. And up until that point, I was still getting paid. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I went back to work and said, you know, I need you to find me light duties. They said, we can't. So I got in touch with a lawyer and they basically said, well, they can. They're just not doing it. So eventually a lawyer got in touch with them and, you know, they come to some agreements and I I was medically retired on ill health grounds. But during that time, you know, lots and lots of bills mounted up because, as I say, I was in this state where I just didn't care about anything. And as a result of that, um, I, I got divorced and then I moved into my own place. And uh, then it was I, I started weaning off Siroxat by using the liquid um, form. And that whole process took me a total of 21 months to finally uh, get off Siroxat. In fact, I uh, weaned off 40 milligrams a day to 22 milligrams a day and that took 19 months Um, and then I just I quit cold turkey which I wouldn't recommend to anybody but I I did this and I informed my doctor that I was going to do it and he advised me not to do it but 
I just wanted to get, you know, rid of this, this stranglehold on me. So I went cold turkey and for three months pretty much battened down the hatches and um, rode the storm, so to speak. I mean, it sounds it sounds quite easy when you're talking about it, but it, it wasn't. It was it was really difficult, you know. Well, Bobby, in your book, The Siroxat Scandal, that's the bit that really hit home with me because you describe the agonising time of reducing by tiny amounts over many months. And you can almost feel your sense of, oh, I've had enough of this and I just need to get past the drugs. And you share the emails with your doctor and then talk about climbing the walls in the latter stages of your withdrawal. And that experience comes across so powerfully. Well, yeah, it was uh, it was pretty hard to write, actually, because... You know, I I um, I had to recall. I had to go back in time and and remember the the really really tough times when I was on Siroxat. And of course, Siroxat, even though it's never been proven, I I, I do do believe it to be true. Um, you, you kind of lose memories, so you can't recall certain things. I mean, there was incidents. You know, just just short term memory you know, putting gravy granules in a washing machine because you're not concentrating, you're not focusing, you know. I was lucky because at the time I was living alone and I've always said that I believe it's sometimes harder for the people looking in rather than the person going through it because the people looking in, usually loved ones, just don't know what's going on and, you know, they think that their their husband or their wife or their child has gone crazy they don't relate it to the drugs and the intention of the book was to uh, kind of highlight that this is a drug thing and it's it's not a chemical imbalance thing you know and and also it was uh, uh, the book was to to really target the british drug regulator the mhra because i'd had a lot of correspondence with them you know over the years and and still do to this day but it's, it's more official these days, you know. Well, again, the book is brilliant because it clearly sets out your experience, but then talks about what drove you to your tireless campaigning and your investigative approach. It's explosive and it's something that people really should read. Yeah, thanks. Uh, when I first started researching, um, there was very little known about Soroxa because, as you know, Soroxat is it goes by a different brand name in the United States. It's called Paxil in the US and, and of course Canada and Arapax in Australia and New Zealand. So when I first, first started to research it, basically I was just getting the GSK website come up, you know, yeah. and so just reading good things about it. And then I stumbled upon an article um, by an investigative journalist called Evelyn Pringle. She was talking about a drug called Paxil and um, in uh, her article, in brackets, was mentioned that Paxil is paroxetine, which is the generic name, of course, for Siroxat. And from that point, I st- then started researching Paxil, and there was just a wealth of information out there. And I, I often wondered why, you know, drug companies choose to uh, call drugs by different names in different countries. And I actually believe it's because of this reason, because when somebody has a problem with it and starts to research it in their own country. Very little will come up. Of course, you Google it by a different name, then you might find that um, there's lots of people talking about it. So, yeah, it was it was really Evelyn Pringle's work that, that set the ball rolling for the block because I thought, well, if, if this, this woman out in Wisconsin can, uh, can write about it, then... I feel that, you know, I can write about it in England and and warn UK consumers. Well, Bobby, your work and your blog is testament to that. I wanted to ask a little about your campaigning. You have over 11 years of raising awareness of these issues. Your blog has had well over 2 million visits, and you are well recognised and respected by many and disrespected by many, including being labelled a conspiracy theorist by some. Challenging the accepted wisdom and trying to shake people out of their delirium about these drugs is exhausting and personally challenging. What is it that motivates you to keep up the work that you do? Well, um, when I first started writing the blog, it was pretty much a selfish thing because it was all about me and my experiences on Siroxad and what it did to me, 
so I wanted answers. So it was purely based on um, just on me wanting to find why this drug company and drug regulator allowed this to happen. And then uh, along came a story uh, about a young girl from Canada, Sarah Carlin, who hanged herself while she was on this drug. And I started writing about it and got in touch with Sarah's dad, Neil Carlin. And we struck up this, this great friendship, which you know still remains uh, today. And I covered the whole of Sarah's inquest. And it was at that point I realized this isn't just about me. This is about... This is about kids dying, and and it's about you know adults going out and committing crimes, and it's about adults killing themselves, and it's not just about Siroxat, it's about all these SSRIs, and it was at that point that um, that's when the blog kind of kicked off when I was covering Sarah Carlin's uh, inquest, and I was getting contacted by um, many people and saying, well, you know this happened to so-and-so too. Can you write an article about that? And of course, at that point, I was getting inundated with uh, with emails. And you can, it's not that I, I pick and choose, it's, it's just that I have to sometimes because there's so many people out there that want to um, tell their story. And more recently, I don't know whether you've noticed on the blog, I offer guest posts because there are people out there that that can write, they just don't know it. So when they write to me, I can see how articulated they are. And I just say, well, would you like to tell your story in your own words? One, because I think it's therapeutic for them. And two, it's very powerful when you're reading the words of a mother who's who's lost a child. So the reason why I continue to do what I do is, you know, and it, and it, it sounds kind of uh, sycophantic, but it's not. I, I do it for those that have died as a result of these drugs. And, um, you know, I want answers, and I believe the parents of all those kids that have died as a result of these drugs um, should have those answers too. That comes across so strongly in your blog, the reaching out to people to help them avoid family tragedy and exposing the truth. What's also interesting is that you've been able to identify that pharmaceutical manufacturers are visiting your blog. They know what you post, and that's a measure of how much impact your work has had, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I remember once I was out in uh, Los Angeles, and um, I was at an award uh, ceremony out there, and, and uh, we went to an after-show party, and this this woman approached me and she was kind of very, very coy. And she said, are you Bobby Fiderman? And I said, uh, yeah. And she said, I need to tell you this. Um, I'm here because I'm seeing lawyers in America. I, I'm a whistleblower and I used to work for GSK. And I can't tell you about the case, but what I can tell you is that GSK cringe at your blog. And that made me sleep very well. I, I, I don't get paid for what I do. It's entirely voluntary. But when I um, receive comments like that, that's, that's worth an, it's, it's worth more than a million pounds to me, you know. The fact that I am making some of the executives there cringe at what I do, and of course they're highly paid attorneys. Mm. It's like music to my ears. Well, it's testament to how much effort and research goes into your work, and the regulators should be uncomfortable because they wouldn't be feeling that way if there weren't things to hide. Well, you know, they really, uh, GSK, you know, if I was uh, hired by GSK to um, give them a, a better public image, I would just say, come clean, put it all out there, and then move on. But, of course, they don't. And they're not the only one. It's other pharmaceutical companies, too. They've been denying uh, this problem for years and years and years and will continue to do so, you know, in, in, in court cases, particularly in the States. They um, normally settle out of court for, you know, withdrawal problems on these drugs. There was over 3,000 plaintiffs um, received a settlement from GSK, I think it was around about 2003 or 2002, um, and of course they admitted no liability. So as a result of that, the, 
people in the UK who were suing GTK for exactly the same thing are being told that, no, it, it wasn't our drug that caused the withdrawal problems, when they pretty much already admitted it in the United States by making settlements with over 3,000 plaintiffs. And, of course, the settlements that are made uh, have gagging orders attached. So uh, those 3,000 people can't talk about it, you know. Mm. And all, all the files are sealed, so we can't use the files in, in UK courts. It's just ridiculous. And, you know, I love the work that lawyers do, particularly in America, and I love that they, that they get these cases to trial. I just don't like the way that they're settled. Now, I understand litigation. It's not about justice. It's about getting the party or parties, um, you know, uh, a, a decent outcome. I agree, and I know that a settlement might be partially a victory for the plaintiff and also partially a victory for the pharmaceutical company, but it's not a victory for the truth, is it? Well, no, it's not. Um, but, you know, like I say, at the end of the day, uh, litigation um, is just not about the truth, and a lot of people out there don't understand that. You know, they think if, if they're part of a class action lawsuit, great, we're going to get our day in court, we're going to get justice. Well, no, you're not. You're going to get... Um, compensation for the hell that they put you through and that's about it you know and bobby talking a little more about legal proceedings you were actually present for the trial between wendy dolan and GlaxoSmithKline, and your work in capturing the details of the trial allowed people like me to get a little window into what the proceedings are like and the complexities involved during your time there were you shocked or surprised by the revelations of the trial or did it just confirm what you'd felt all along I, I wasn't really, uh, you know, I was more shocked at how poor GSK's attorneys King and Spalding were. I was pretty shocked that they, you know, they didn't have um, much behind them, it, you know, by way of defense. It was, they were pretty much blaming, um, you know, first of all, Stuart Dolan because he had a mental disorder when. He didn't have a mental disorder. They was blaming Stuart's doctor for prescribing him the uh, Paxil, Soroxat, and they was also blaming the FDA. So that was their defence. You know, they wasn't really defending the fact that Paxil can cause suicide. They was defending all the people that prescribed it or took it or regulated it. It was an eye-opener for me, for sure. I mean, to actually be in the court, first of all, with... Um, King and Spalding, because uh, during the past, I kind of slammed them on my blog, particularly one of their lawyers who was actually at trial. And so it was quite, it was, let's say it was fulfilling to sit down on the bench there right next to the jury and have uh, and watch GSK um, cross-examine Wendy Dolan's witnesses. It was, it was fulfilling in that much because they knew that I was there. They knew that I was there, and um, I got I got some gratification out of that. <laughs> I really did. Um, but of course, at the end of the day, what we have to remember is that this was about a man who took Paxil and dived in front of a train because of this condition that we now know called akathisia, which is relatively a new word to lots and lots of people out there. Even doctors, you can go to a doctor and you can mention akathisia and he might sort of like nod and agree with you and I bet you he'll be going home that night researching what it actually means. It's not a well-known term, but it can be so fundamentally damaging to people's lives, can't it? It's, it's really weird because, you know, I kind of stay away from uh, doctors and I've recently moved and I had to, I had to go and see a GP because I suffer sometimes with um, gout in my big toe. So I went there and he had to give me some sort of blood test. Now I got a terrible phobia with needles. I am seriously bad. And he actually said to me, and I told him this, and he actually said to me, well, your uh, blood test isn't until Monday. This was a Friday. Um, I can prescribe you a benzo, if you like, to take the edge off. And I said, you don't know what I do, do you? <laughs> and uh, he says, no, no, I don't. And, you know, I explained and I explained that I was going to Chicago for the Dolan trial. 
And his answer to that was, well, Ciroc said, I prescribe it and it's helped many patients. And that's the kind of, that's the kind of uh, attitude that you get. You know, it's a bit like saying, well, I smoke and it's not, not given me lung cancer. Mm. You know, we all know in the end that chances are you're probably going to get it, you know, if you keep on smoking. So, um, yeah, we need to change. We need to change attitudes. It's hard to change the attitudes of doctors because, you know, they've been through 10 years of med school and, you know, and they, they look at you and they think, well, what do you know? You know, you just, you're just a blogger. Well, the truth of the matter is, I probably know more about SSRIs than most of your average uh, general practitioners mm. because they only know a little bit about each illness and about each drug. They don't have time to do the research that I've done. Um, but, yeah. Uh, one of my one of my pet gripes is the uh, is the attitude of uh, healthcare professionals, and I receive many emails off uh, people trying to get off these drugs, saying that my GP told me that it wasn't the drug, this, that, and the other. I just wish, oh, I, I once uh, um, uh, told this this lady she emailed me about her doctor having a particularly difficult time with him explaining about withdrawal and I told her to print off some of the stuff on my blog and she did and she got back to me and and the doctor said don't believe in conspiracies so that's so that, that's what we're facing you know it's such a shame because if doctors were better educated on this they could potentially help many more people but people like you and I end up managing ourselves and become unwilling to share these experiences with medics doctors tend to go by the um uh, when they prescribe a drug to their, let's just say they've got 100 patients uh, that are on psychiatric medication. And if if the, these meds are doing well for 60 or 70, then they see that as, well, great, it's winning, you know. But what they don't take into account, of course, is the placebo effect uh, on these drugs. And they don't take into account that, you know, everybody's um, metabolism is, is different. And, you know, some people can... Um, tolerate the drugs others can't and I was one of those that couldn't you know so um, uh, yeah they need they need to take that into account they need to listen to patients you know they don't need to look down their noses at them and and, and say well you know I, I know more than you because I went to med school and like I say all they need to do is do their research it's all out there the evidence is all out there it's just that they tend to toe the line of the um you know of the medical world thank you and again bobby there's a really strong thread in your book about regulation the uk is probably similar to the us canada australia europe and many other places in that we seem to have a fundamentally flawed far too cozy relationship between the pharmaceutical manufacturers the prescribers of the drugs and the regulatory bodies such as the mhra in the uk and the fda in the us who is most at fault for the epidemic of overprescribing and the fact that we're not told anything like the full story about the drugs? It's a really, really good question. And, and of course, there's a lots of different answers. Um, I actually believe that the MHRA really should hang their heads in shame um, for what they have allowed to fester. Um, they know that these drugs can cause people severe withdrawal problems. They know that these drugs can cause people to go out and kill themselves and even think about killing themselves, and they have done nothing. All the MHRA do is backslap one another when they shut down an online pharmacy. That's big, big news for them, you know. What they don't do is when people send in a yellow car report for an adverse reaction, they don't follow those reports up. They love them and they forget about them. And then they cover themselves in garlands by saying that, yes, we, we love these reports. We listen to the consumers out there. Well, they don't. All they do is they stick them in a database, and when you ask them and you say something like, listen, there's been over 1,000 deaths, suicides uh, that have been sent in to you regarding a particular drug, they will say, well, just because the suicide happened while they was on the drug 
doesn't necessarily mean that the drug caused it. And my question is, well, why don't you go out and speak to the doctors who prescribed this drug or family members? And the truth of the matter is they don't. So I would lay a large portion of the blame on the MHRA mm. and, of course, in America, the FDA. I've said it before and I'll say it again. There is an incestuous relationship going on here with the pharmaceutical companies and the regulators. And Bobby, in your 11 years that you've been writing about these issues, what's your view of the MHRA over that time? Have they changed their approach? Well, with the MHRA, I mean, I've, I've met the MHRA on a number of occasions. Um, I, I had their media person travel to Birmingham to see me um, because I wanted uh, a meeting with their then CEO, Kent Woods. He's not there anymore. Um, it's changed hands. And this guy travelled to Birmingham to see me, and we went for a coffee. And he, he was a very nice man, the media guy, really, really nice man, until he pulled out something from his briefcase. And it was a print-off of my blog. And he said to me, you really do come across as being um, quite vicious. And I said to him, what are you doing here now? And he said, well, I've come to see you because you've been writing to us. And I said, if I would have wrote to you, uh, you know, nicely, or I would have um, pictured, uh, painted the MHRA in a nice way, you wouldn't have come to see me. The only reason you're coming to see me is because I write in the style that I do and, and you're not going to change it. Anyway, eventually I did manage to go and see their CEO, Kent Woods, and I sat down with him and explained the problem that people were having with these drugs, the withdrawal problem. It wasn't just Siroxat. You know, I, I lumped all the SSRIs together. I used Siroxat in the main in my conversation with him because I'd got plenty of experience with that, you know. And I remember it was one of those defining moments, and it, it will stay with me for the rest of my life. There was Kent Woods, there was the media guy, and there was a woman there from the pharmacology department. And I pulled out a packet of jelly babies, and I said to them, I want to do an experiment with you all. And they kind of looked at me dumbfounded. So I handed them each a jelly baby, and I told them to bite the head off of the jelly baby, which they did, and they swallowed like good boys and girls. And then I pulled out a packet of Tic Tacs, and I handed them one each. And I said, now, bite about a third of the Tic Tac off. And, of course, they tried, and the whole thing just crumbled. And I said to them, this is the problem people are having with Siroxat and other drugs. And it was at that point then that Kent Woods reached for the BNF, the British National Formulary, and he read the advice given in there, which there really wasn't much advice in there. And he promised me that he would write to the BNF and ask them to amend it. And I thought, wow, what a result. Mm. But of course, he never did. I also uh, set up a meeting with the MHRA and David Healy. And I said, you need to listen to this guy. He's got um, some ideas about tapering off these drugs. David went to see them. They agreed with me, and David went to see them. And um, to this day, his ideas are still collecting cobwebs on the MHRA table. So they meet you to appease you, nothing more. It's damning, isn't it? Because they are the regulator. They are the ones meant to be providing the safety interface between us as patients using these products and the might of the pharmaceuticals. The buck stops with them to make this situation safer for everyone. Yeah, well, and of course now, as I said earlier, the uh, the CEO has now changed hands, and um, the CEO of the MHRA now is Dr. Ian Hudson, who um, <laughs> used to work at GlaxoSmithKline, and he was the world safety officer at GlaxoSmithKline. And now here he is regulating the drugs that you and I and millions of others take. 
again, it's just incestuous. And Bobby, I assume that these issues apply equally to the FDA in the US as well as the MHRA in the UK. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, all the regulators, Health Canada um, and uh, the TGA in Australia, um, they've all got these these relationships going on with um, with the drug regulator. You know, the MHRA are entirely funded by the industry. Now, you know, just let that sink in for a little bit. They're entirely funded by the industry. And recently I put a question to them under the Freedom of Information Act, and they wrote back to me and they said that they wanted paying for it. So <laughs> there's a guy harmed by drugs who wants answers to questions and they want me to pay for that. So the MHRA and I have had this relationship over the years where at one point I was helping them come up with better ideas, uh, for example, for the yellow car reporting system. I was actually helping them. And the reason why I fell out with them was because there was a trial in America where uh, a young boy was born with heart defects, Liam Kilker, and the drug that he was on was Paxil. And it came out at trial that this drug is a known teratogen. You know, it can harm the fetus. So when I wrote to Kent Woods and sent him all the documents from the trial and said, why is it not classed as a teratogen in the UK from the MHRA, but the FDA class it as a teratogen? Don't you think you've got a duty to, to warn pregnant mothers out there? And his answer was something along the lines of just because it's came out in court doesn't mean it's true. You know, and, and the jury found for the Kilker child, you know. So it was at that point, I, I think I wrote something along the line. I, I just called them limp-wristed and, and kind of pulled away from them. And uh, the only correspondence I have with them now is official, and it's just freedom of information requests, you know. It's funny because a few years ago in the UK, there was a public outcry because the water supply companies were in charge of environmental laws, while they themselves were often the biggest environmental polluters. And this led to the creation of a totally independent, government-funded regulator. But the MHRA still seemed to be acting as poacher and gamekeeper. No, they can't. But, you know, what they can do is, is actually act upon patient concerns mm. And, and they currently don't do that. Now, there are, um, there are other organisations out there, nothing to do with antidepressants, that have kind of got results from the MHRA uh, through years of talking to them. But it's not, it's not as a result of the pressure that these, these groups put on them. It's when the media gets hold of the information. That's when they only act. So they don't really see patient advocates such as myself and and you as as threats they they kind of just see us as um well for want of a better word conspiracy theorists you know? <laughs> it's such a reductive argument isn't it calling people conspiracists who are just trying to expose behaviors that are conspiratorial it's just laughable well it is when you've got the biggest conspiracy out there i.e the, the um depression and mental illness is caused by a chemical imbalance you know i've never i have never um and i really don't understand why um people still believe in this you know and as you know i've just recently started a sister blog up and i'm highlighting celebrities that have made these uh, outlandish claims that uh, depression is caused by a chemical imbalance in the brain. It's just indoctrination. And, and I have to take my hat off to the marketing teams of these pharmaceutical companies. I think it was Eli Lilly that first pushed this chemical imbalance thing out. You really have to take your hat off to them because it was genius marketing, so much so that it still exists today. If you tell a story and then that story can continue um, throughout the years, then bloody hell, it's, that's a powerful story. It's almost impossible to challenge, isn't it? Well, it is, you know, and, and we now, those that do challenge, have become the conspiracy theorists mm. when the whole um, chemical imbalance thing was basically a huge conspiracy there there was never ever any proof they needed something to tell patients 
that um, uh, a drug can fix, and that's the way that they did it. You've got a chemical imbalance. If you take this drug, it will sort it out for you. Well, no. You know, the, the chemical imbalances do occur, yes, but only when you start taking these types of drugs. It's a common theme, Bobby, as you know, in many of the discussions that I've had. And it strikes you that the chemical imbalance is the central plank of the reason for treatment with psychiatric drugs. And if that is taken away, then it forces the experts to question the whole basis of mental health care. Yeah, it's, it, you know, it's one of them. And some when I first started doing this, at times I... I almost felt like, oh, should I be should I be saying this because, you know, this person uh, who's contacting me or whatever may actually need these drugs, you know, or or somebody contemplating on going on these drugs. Should I really be giving an advice out like this? All I ever suggest to people is do your homework. If you land on my blog and you see something on there and it changes your mind, then, then great. But don't just take my word for it. Go out there and, and do your own research, which is what I did. And, the, and you know, the answer is out there. If you dig deep enough, the answer is out there. Now, I understand that when you're uh, coming off a drug, the last thing you want to do is go on a computer and start researching because it is just a minefield of information out there but what the beauty what i've seen over the past few years or so which wasn't around when i first started blogging is uh, facebook and is twitter there is so many people out there that um are going through the uh withdrawal effects of these drugs looking for answers and when you all get together like your facebook group gym you know when you all get together it's like um it's just like fireworks going off it's it's a wonderful display of people actually recognizing oh my god this isn't me this is the drug i agree it's so empowering as you say to see groups of people come together and realize the similarity between the myths and stories that we're told a quick look at Facebook, and there are many groups around antidepressants well in excess of 6,000 members, and it really takes people to come together to challenge those stories, doesn't it? It does. I mean, you could point this out to the MHRA, and, you know, you could say, and which I have done in the past, you know, there's, there's literally thousands of people writing about their problems online, and the MHRA's response is, we don't accept anecdotal reports. Well, what is the yellow card reporting system? It's not an anecdotal report because they don't follow them up. <laughs> so it's ridiculous, you know. They're having their cake and eating it. They know there's a problem. They know there's a problem, but of course, to admit that there is will highlight their failings. Bobby, I wanted to ask if you could help me understand briefly how the MHRA yellow card scheme is meant to work. Well, the yellow card scheme is basically when a patient or doctor um, flags up uh, an adverse reaction to a drug. So it could be, you know, a, a person goes to the doctor, um, he gets put on a drug, goes back two weeks later and said, yeah, the drug's working fine, but I've been getting these headaches. So then uh, the doctor may send in a yellow card report to the MHRA. They then log it, put it on a huge database, and so it might be the 500th headache that they've had reported about this drug, and then they will add it to a database, and the database is publicly available on the MHRA website. But here's, here's the thing. Even though it's been uh, a side effect reported with drug A, doesn't necessarily mean that drug A caused it. Now, for me, the way to uh, try and figure out if drug A did cause it would be to go out and investigate it, something that the MHRA don't do. And I imagine the FDA don't do either. You're right. Why have that reporting system and then take no action in follow-up? It's not making anything safer, is it? Well, it's not, but, you know, it, it kind of makes them look good because they've got this database and it is logged. But when you start asking questions, um, well, what have you done about it? Did you follow up? Say that, say there's 100 reports of suicide on a drug. How many of those um, doctors did you go to visit? 
how many of those surviving family members did you go to visit? And the answer is a big fat zero. It's, it's absurd. It really is absurd. I think it will be shocking for some people to hear that. And there are some like me that used to think that if you or your doctor report an adverse effect, then you kind of expect some action to be taken. But it's shocking to realize that it just disappears into thin air. It, it, it's very shocking. I mean, what's more shocking for me is, you know, I kind of stepped out of the bubble and thought, well, you know, the MHRA have been stole, stonewalling me for years. So I kind of stepped out of the bubble and um, came at them from a different angle. And I asked them, look, you grant these drugs a license by weighing up the uh, benefit risk ratio. We all know about the risks because today, at least, they're clearly marked on the labeling, you know, the side effects so you know, suicidal thinking, self-harm, all the rest of it. So we all know about them, but there isn't anywhere on any drug label that clearly lists the benefits of these drugs. Now, if they're going to grant a license because the benefits outweigh the risks, surely they would be able to show you exactly what the benefits are. And I put this question to them many times and they can't give me an answer it's a simple question and it demands a simple response doesn't it well yeah like like, like i say you know if if you grant a license because the benefits outweigh the risks well show me the benefits and bobby in your view what should we do to make mental health care safer for all in a nutshell listen to patient concerns because we're the ones you know, taking these drugs. It's a bit like, you know, if you if you uh, read um, uh, a review on a website, you're, you know, a, a restaurant, for example, you're more than likely to um, uh, take the words of truth from a customer rather than the chef who's cooked the meal. So you, the, the mental health um, uh, uh, and doctors need to listen to the patients and not just fob them off as, you know, reading too many uh, conspiracy theories. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with the listeners? I just want to sort of like tell people that um, every time uh, I write about individuals, it's tough. It really is tough. And, you know, people sometimes see Bob Fiddeman, the blogger, is this guy that just gets out there and 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 writes about this stuff but it can be very very dark at times it's really difficult to to shake off when you've just sat down with a parent and listened to her talk about her dead child so i'm not always active and the and the reason why i write in my style which is a little bit kind of humorous is because this is a a very, very dark world that we move in. And I sometimes add elements of humor to the work because of that, you know, because I don't want it to be all doom and gloom. And also pharmaceutical companies and MHRA do not like being laughed at. Nobody does, you know, who likes being laughed at? Um, but it's it's a good way to target uh, these these corporations and agencies is to kind of lambast them well again bobby the success of your blog the fact that the regulators and the pharmaceuticals know you follow your activities are worried by what you do it's testament to the power that one loud uncompromising voice can have in this and i want you to know how much the community values you well you know sometimes it's really hard to because you know i'm to me i'm just uh, i'm just a, a regular guy that that writes because um because he can see an injustice going on. And it sometimes shocks me that the blog has been so popular uh, uh, as what as what it is, you know. I mean, two million hits, yeah, I mean, that's great. Okay, it took me 11 years to get those two million hits. But um, it does sometimes surprise me that people from all o- over the world are, you know, reading uh, my words. And, and that's great, you know. I mean, it's... Uh, yeah, it makes me feel good, but it, it also, um, I'm sure, doesn't make the regulators and the pharmaceutical companies feel good because I'm not going to go away. Well, long may it continue. Bobby, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Thanks, James. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. And listen, uh, you know, I think you're doing great work with these uh, these podcasts. Obviously, I've not listened to them all, but the 
ones that I have listened to were very enlightening. Well, thank you, Bobby. I'm just grateful that people such as yourself are willing to share experiences with me. Yeah. Also, you know, before before we finish off, I would say that there are many people and, you know, I've noticed on and certainly on your Facebook group and and others drop the disorder and and all the others on Facebook. There are many people that are so articulated that leave comments and it would be great if they actually got their hands dirty and went out there and started blogging because I've seen bloggers come and go in the last 11 years and pretty much now there's only me and the truth man um, in in Ireland, um, a, a GSK License to Kill, one of the best blog names I've ever read, and of course Leonie Fennell, uh, who we all know, um, that really blog about it and I think more people are needed to get out there and bang the drum that there's obviously talent out there people can write and and it's fun too if once you start researching once you get beyond the darkness of it all it's really fun to stick down onto a blog and have people read it well bobby your interview will inspire others to capture their experiences too so thank you yeah well thanks thanks for having me on jim i really appreciate it I'm so grateful to Bobby for taking the time to chat with me. I recommend you visit Bobby's blog. It's an absolute wealth of information and has some very entertaining, shocking and fascinating articles. To find it, visit fiddleman.blogspot.com. Madden America News and Updates On Madden America, we wanted to let you know that on September the 12th, family therapist Marilyn Wedge and psychologist Gretchen Lefevre Watson will present an MIA continuing education webinar on non-drug interventions for youth diagnosed with ADHD. Nationally respected psychologist and family therapist Dr. Gretchen Lefevre Watson and Dr. Marilyn Wedge will show research that contradicts the mainstream conceptualization and treatment of ADHD in the United States and offer alternatives to psychiatric drugs for effectively resolving challenging behaviors at school and home. The webinar will be held on September 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, and 5 p.m. British Summer Time. The webinar will last for approximately 90 minutes, and registration is $20. The course is designed to educate mental health professionals as well as the general public. To find out more and to register, visit maddenamerica.com and use the link at the top right-hand side of the homepage. So thank you for listening today. Please come back next week for another episode, and until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.